Well, amen. If you are joining us right here in the room, welcome to you. If you're joining us online, welcome to you. My name is Jeremy, and I get the joy and the privilege of being one of the pastors here at Coastway Church. So we are picking up in week two of our Christmas series, Here Comes Heaven. Heaven is less of a place you go as it is a person you know. May we know this person better through our time uh, in this place together today. So whether it's on your app or in your lap, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. And if you don't have a copy on your app or in your lap, the scriptures will be on the screens so that you can follow along with the true story of Christmas from Luke chapter 1. And chapter 2, in 1952, there was an accomplished women's swimmer by the name of Florence Chadwick. Now, Florence set out on a very ambitious journey. She decided that she was going to attempt to swim the 26-mile span between the coast of California and the Catalina Island, just 26 miles off the coast. And so right before she began, there were boats that flanked ahead of her. And basically their job was to make sure that she didn't get eaten by a shark. Or that if she really found herself in a place to where she was exhausted, overwhelmed, helpless, hopeless, she could signal they would bring her aboard. And so as she began the 26 miles, 26 miles, can you believe that she's about to do this? 26 miles uh, journey to Catalina Island, she gets 15 hours into this journey, swimming, there's this thick fog that sets in. And she can't see ahead of her, and she starts to feel herself overwhelmed, exhausted. She begins to feel helpless, and she begins, begins to feel hopeless. Amazingly, she continued to swim for another hour, at which point she signaled to those who were aboard the boats nearby, I need help, I'm tapping out. And so they brought Florence aboard the boats, and 16 hours into this swim, she quickly realized that she had swam 25 miles. She was one mile from Catalina Island. And it dawned on her that if she had just kept going a little bit farther, she would have made it. So a few months later, Florence does the same thing. She sets out to span 26 miles, and the same thick fog sets in, in the same place, about the same time. Except something was different this time. She makes it to the island. And after she makes it to the island, she was asked, what was it that was different about this time? And she said, I had a clear mental image of the shoreline that never left me. And I was focused on the shoreline the entire time. I did not have that picture in my heart or in my mind the first time. She went on to do this two more times, by the way. I mean, unbelievable. And here's what I want to share with you from this story. Maybe you feel like there is a fog that has set in over your life. Maybe you feel helpless. Maybe you feel hopeless. In some area, maybe there is a fear, maybe there is a frustration, maybe there is a failure that is leading you to a place where you feel like you can't go on. And what I want to share with you is that God in Christ is the shoreline. And if you can keep God in Christ as your mental heart image, when the fog sets in, you can continue moving. If you really believe that your, your perseverance is going to go as well as your God view, that if you believe that God really cares, if you believe that God really controls, it doesn't matter how much you can't see ahead of you, you can keep going. And today, I, I believe that if you, if you feel helpless in some way, I think that's probably all of us, if you feel hopeless in some way, I think that's probably all of us, uh, Christmas can be a very discouraging time of the year. It can be very holly, very jolly, very deck the halls, but it can also be very discouraging, right? This is real talk to real people living real life. Well, today, here's what I believe can happen. I think that help and hope can multiply in your life through the strength and through the courage that we gain from God's Word. 
Because here's what we're going to do. We're going to meet two women, two amazing women. The first woman who we're going to meet, we talked about her last week. Her name is Mary. The next woman that we're going to meet, her name is Elizabeth. And here's what you need to know about women in the Greco-Roman culture and the New Testament day. Women were marginalized. Women did not have the rights. Women did not have the access. Women did not have the education. Women did not have the uh, basic privileges that are often taken for granted today in this society and in this day and age. Particularly women who were young and single. Particularly women who were old and barren. And these two women who we meet fit all of those criteria. The first is Mary. Consider Mary. She is an illiterate, likely illiterate, small town teenage girl, probably with some acne. And she's struggling to fit in, maybe figuring out who she is, struggling um, for hope all of her young life. She lived in a politically oppressive historical moment. She's recently pledged to marry a young carpenter named Joseph. Late teens, early 20s, can't even rent a car yet in today's day. And an unexpected visitor shows up to Mary's home, which was probably the size of a parking space. Very modest living arrangement. And this angel sent from God announces the good news that she has been chosen to bear the Son of God who's been prophesied of old. And as we saw last week, what was the effect that this news had on Mary? Well, imagine if an angel appeared to you and just told you something weighty, something significant. Well, naturally, uh, she was confused. (laughs) She was afraid. And she had a lot of questions. But despite the overwhelming nature of this news, faith populates in how she responds. She says, let it, be, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed. And then we're about to meet a woman named Elizabeth. A little bio on Elizabeth. She was an elderly, barren woman married to a, a modest priest named Zechariah who had a small ministry in a, a humble, small town. And all their life, here's what you need to know, they hope to have kids. Never able to do it. And so Elizabeth gets invited to the baby shower. She shows up with a smile on her face, but inwardly she feels hopeless. Elizabeth and Zechariah, they see children running in the streets. And although they might share a smile with these children inside, they feel hopeless. And when she gets asked the question, hey, Elizabeth, I imagine she probably got so tired of hearing this question. When are you going to have kids of your own? her heart would sink in her chest and she would feel hopeless. But earlier in chapter 1, a plot twist unfolds. The angel who appeared to Mary had previously appeared to Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah. He was doing holy work in a holy place in a very important way, and the news is announced to Zechariah, your wife Elizabeth in her old age is going to, to have her womb opened and is going to bear a son, and you will call him John the Baptist. He will prepare the way for the king of creation. What a calling. And here's what Zechariah struggled with. He struggled to believe. Can you relate? God makes a great promise to you, and you find yourself in your feelings, losing sight of your faith, and you just have a hard time. Zechariah, in a moment of disbelief, he's like, how is this going to happen? And I I don't understand all of what was going on right here, but he was rendered speechless by the angel until the arrival of the Son because he disbelieved. This leads us to one of the great and glorious themes of Christmas, and it's this. If you're taking notes, I would encourage you to write this down. God gives help to the helpless and hope to the hopeless. Luke chapter 1, verse 39, let's begin. In those days... Notice that it doesn't say in a galaxy far, far away. In those days, we are reading actual history from an actual historian, well-educated, knows his stuff, well-documented. This really happened. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. Verse 40, and she entered the house of Zechariah 
and greeted Elizabeth. What I love about Mary's excitement and urgency is how this may have been one of the first and few times in her young life when her heart was full of hope. And she was eager. She went with haste to share this hope. And what is hope? Well, hope is a first cousin to faith. You really can't talk about hope without talking about faith. You can't talk about faith without talking about hope. Where faith lives, hope lives. Where hope lives, faith lives. Faith is active confidence that God cares and that He's in control. Not just mental assent. I actively believe that. I'm actively confident. I'm going to order my life around that conviction. God cares and He is in control. But what is hope? Hope really balloons out of faith and it says, good from God is coming. That's what hope is. You see, it's possible to hope, but not hope in God. We, we do this often. Maybe you, maybe you fall in love. Okay, as innocent and charming as that may seem, you, you, you have hope. Okay, something good is coming, especially if they like you back. Uh, maybe you're nearing graduation. Okay, I have, I have hope. It's almost over. I've almost finished something that I started. Uh, you get a, you're hoping there's a chance you're going to get a bonus or a raise at the end of the year. What does that do? It brings some level of hope. You're going to spend Christmas with your in-laws. That's something. Okay, that, I'm not, I'll leave you to decide whether or not that's actually hope. It's hard to keep hope to yourself. Here's something about hope. Hope is hard to keep to yourself. Hope does not make a good secret. Eleanor walked uh, in, in the house after sh- uh, my four-year-old daughter, after she and my wife Victoria were shopping uh, uh, this past week. And she walks in, and basically, in her sweet little unassuming way, she tells me everything that she and mommy looked at for getting daddy for Christmas. So I, I basically know everything that I'm getting for Christmas. She, she was, had the hope of the excitement that I would like what they were picking out for me for uh, Christmas. So I probed, I pressed a little bit, and I made sure that I got to the bottom of you know the good that is coming. There's hope. And... Here's the hope that Mary experiences. Gabriel announced to Mary not just that her womb was being opened, but the old barren womb of her cousin Elizabeth has been opened, and she is six months pregnant. She's showing, ladies and gentlemen. And she, she hasn't told anybody. She's at home worshiping. She's at home getting the nursery ready. She's at home chuckling that her husband can't talk. And some of the wives in the house today are like, where can I find an angel like that? Well, that's actually a sermon for another time. But Mary resolves, I must see Elizabeth. She's pregnant. I'm pregnant. She has hope. I have hope. Our bellies need to touch and we need to hope together. So she travels to see her cousin. But here's what you need to understand. For Mary, this wasn't as simple as walking a few blocks. She did not get in a car and drive 20 minutes. Here's what we need to see. Great community comes at a great cost. Nazareth, where Mary was, it was a northern hamlet in Palestine, is on the opposite side of Palestine of where Judea was, this hill country, about 100 miles. Mary is pregnant, and she sets off on a, about a 100-mile journey in 100 degree heat by herself. We'll see you at community group this week. But here's the question. How much of a cost are you willing to pay to be in community? You see, around Coastway, these Mary and Elizabeth friendships form in what we call community groups. These are smaller groups of 10 to 15 men, women, and children who gather weekly in homes to do what? Multiply hope and multiply help in the lives of one another. And along the way, what's going to happen? We're going to hit the headwinds, we're going to experience hardships, and we're going to shoulder the burden of those together. And we're going to put more shoulders underneath what's going on in our lives that's heavy, that's weighty, that's significant together. Loved ones, the Bible teaches how every Christian is called to community in at least two ways. Relationships and responsibility. So you ask the question, it's a fair question, what about COVID? Well, there's a very simple answer to that. Relationships and responsibility. Or maybe you ask, what if I'm out of town? 
relationships and responsibility. What if I had a long day at work and I'm tired? Relationships and responsibility. What if it's my turn to cook, to host, or to care for Coastway kids? Relationships and responsibility. What if the kids don't quite get to bed on time? Relationships and responsibility. As with Mary, community will cost you. But I'm here to tell you, it is worth it. Why? Because community makes the good times twice as good and the bad times half as bad. I imagine that you're thinking about your physical family this Christmas season. That no shame, no shade, you should. But how much are you thinking about your spiritual family this Christmas season? Here's what often happens. The order of our priority, especially around special occasions and seasons like Christmas, is to forget about the spiritual family and put all the focus on the physical family. But God has bought us with His blood through Jesus Christ, the baby born, not just so that we would be closer to a biological family, but that we would be eternally closer to a spiritual family. Both are important. Let's prioritize them this Christmas. Verse 41, And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby, the baby, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 42, And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed, not cursed, blessed is the fruit of your womb. The first truth that I want to showcase today is simply this. God gives help to the helpless. I want to ask you, I don't want to assume anything. You can't assume anything. This is the most educated age and stage of American history and simultaneously the most uneducated, biblically, age and stage in American history. So we can't assume anything. Who are the most helpless characters in this story? And I'll give you a hint. It's not Mary and Elizabeth. It's the two babies in utero, John and Jesus God's heart always has been, always will be, for the helpless. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus and look away or turn away from children. When we talk about those who are helpless, we think about the least. We we should often. We think about the last. We should often. But we should always think about the littlest Jesus rebuked his disciples when they tried to turn away little children. What does this tell us? It tells us that children are very important, imputed with eminent dignity and utter equality by God in his sight. So it tells us that. It also tells us he was fun because you don't see kids running up to an Ebenezer Scrooge. You don't see kids running up to people who are just a cranky pants all the time. Kids are going to go up to someone who is is fun, is approachable. And in verse 41 through 42, what is happening? Feel this. Elizabeth is prophetically declaring the heart of God. She is filled with the Holy Spirit, prophesying to Mary, blessed is the child in your womb. Children are a blessing. But in the Greco-Roman world, children were often considered accursed. In pre-Christian and post-Christian societies, this is the narrative. In, in this day and age, especially girls, the unwanted babies would be left for dead outdoors and in trash heaps. And 50 years ago, check this out, the average woman had five children. Today, women are waiting longer than ever and having fewer children than ever before, down to a little bit less than two. Apparently, by 2025, adult diapers will outsell infant diapers in China. Why is this? Well, it's because there is a rhetoric in the fabric of our culture that disbelieves in the sanctity and value and dignity and need and hope that is found in children who are often considered more of a curse than a blessing. Here's the narrative. If you have kids, you're going to gain weight. You're going to get stretch marks. You're going to lose freedom. You're going to limit advancement. 
I'm not saying that's all wrong. I'm saying that's not all helpful. Yes, children who burp, teeth, feed, spit, cry, and keep you up all night are a blessing. You want to see a healthy church, well, then you're going to see two things. You're going to see a church that is having children. Amen. At Coastway, we are having children. It's incredible. But you're also going to see a church that is discipling children. And here's the hall pass, how we masquerade our way around discipling the next generation. is we say, care for kids, disciple for kids, is more of a style than a surrender. And I'm here to tell you that the multi-generational vision of God does not leave a category for excluding children in our discipleship frames. And so it is a blessing, Commission Launch Team, it is a blessing to be invited to participate in partnering with parents to raise a generation in Christ, to help children meet Jesus, make friends, have fun, be safe, give all that they know of themselves to all that they know of God at a very early age and stage. Have you ever considered why Jesus didn't appear as a grown man, but a helpless baby? Well, here's why. It's because his heart is so devoted to humanity that he would spare no expense. Yes, we get that but also no experience, even that of a child to draw near to us. Even if it meant appearing as a helpless child in the womb, no group is more helpless than children in the womb. And the Gospel of Luke is designed to dignify every age and stage of human life. This is from the womb to the tomb. God is about life, not death. Isn't it amazing how the good news of Christmas would not be possible apart from two babies in the wombs of two women worshiping? What this does is this brings clarity. Clarity into the confusion and the controversy surrounding the explosive issue of abortion. And maybe you don't want to talk about it. Maybe this hits deep, hits different, and you're like, can we please talk about anything else? We've got to talk about it. We've got to talk about it. It's in the text, and it's all around us. And what we need, what Christ does is He brings order from chaos. He brings clarity to confusion. And if we are walking in good faith, if we are practicing good faith, if we are preaching good sermons, if we are having good spiritual discussions We're not going to leapfrog around those gaslighting issues that are going on everywhere around us. And this is one of them. Here is the lie that we are told and that we are sold. Abortion is primarily an issue of women's rights and health care. So let's engage. Uh, It was in November of this year that there was a Saturday Night Live skit that featured uh, a news anchor interviewing Goober the Clown who had an abortion after her 23rd birthday. And this skit came in response to recent litigation and legislation in the state of Texas that bans abortion after six weeks. And so the entire skit, and I will caution you, if you pull up YouTube and you go to watch this, be prepared for four disturbing minutes of trivializing, normalizing the act of abortion, all while demonizing anyone who would dare oppose. Such pro-abortion rhetoric is further championed by activists such as Amelia Bono, the intellectual architect behind the Shout Your Abortion movement, quote, I'm telling you my story plainly, proudly, flippantly even, because we have all been brainwashed to believe that the absence of negative emotions around an abortion is the mark of an emotionally bankrupt uh, person. She wrote, it's not. I have a good heart, and my abortion made me happy. So what do both Saturday Night Live and the Shout Your abortion stories have in common? 
they are cleverly uh, wrapped in rhetoric that is convincing, that is designed to combat and condemn any form or frame of a pro-life position, which Bono says keeps people in secrecy, shame, poverty, toxic and abusive relationships while devaluing ambitions. Here's the issue. This is a gross distortion of the post-abortive experience of the majority of women. Despite the rhetoric, despite the persuasiveness, despite the appeals, abortion does not make women happy. One in four women will have an abortion by 45. It's more common than you think it is. And if you've had one, you know it. You live with it. You feel it. You're like, yeah, I was wondering when somebody was going to acknowledge it. I was wondering when the church was going to talk about it. 64% felt pressured by others. Over 50% felt it was morally wrong at the time. 78% of women feel deep guilt and shame. 81% are more likely to experience mental health issues. 60% say they felt that a part of themselves died. We need to feel the weight of this and not moonwalk around it and not try to do existential gymnastics around the hard truths. 2021 marks 48 years since the Supreme Court declared abortion to be a fundamental right through Roe v. Wade in 1973. In 2018, abortion was the leading cause of death worldwide with 42 million victims. That is roughly seven holocausts in one year. In 2020, an estimated 900,000 babies in the U.S. were electively and or selectively aborted, which is more than the total American casualties in the two world wars and the Vietnam War combined. In the U.S., 90% of preborn humans diagnosed with Down syndrome are selectively aborted. Pastor Thabiti Anyabwile says it is staggeringly clear that the largest scale injustice, the most morally outrageous thing happening in our society today, is the killing of children in the womb. If as followers of the one who said, let the children come to me. Let the children come to me. If as his followers, we want to defend the helpless and fight true systemic injustice, then there are few places where dire urgency meets such moral clarity and opportunity as with protection of the unborn. And if I get emotional, you should too. I was thinking this week, based off the size and the statistics of our young church, not specifics, the size and the statistics. When you go to pick up your kid in Coastway Kids after the service, there ought to be five more children eating snacks, playing in the floor, joking around, laughing, meeting Jesus, making friends, having fun, and being safe. We need to feel this. Five more. And there was times when even I, I wanted to look away this week. This was the, one of the hardest sermons I've ever prepared to preach ever in 11 years. It's heavy. There was times when I wanted to look away. There was times when I wanted to keep scrolling. There was times when I wanted to close my ears and go back to what's more comfortable don't do it. Don't do it. This is why we preach expositional, which means verse-by-verse -verse sermons, because doing so forces us to rumble with what's actually going on in the world. We are not, I want to say this, we're not a politically motivated church. That's not who we are. Uh, we're not the party of the elephant. We're not the party of the donkey. We are the party of the lamb who alone can take away sin. And that's where we stand 
on the solid rock of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do not believe that salvation comes swooping in on the wings of Air Force One. We believe that salvation in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, was settled and secured on the shoulders of a crucified king who took the place of criminals. That's what we believe. This is not a political sermon. This is a biblical sermon. Sadly, most Christians have not thought deeply enough about the theological and existential consequences of elective and selective abortion. So under the banner of help for the helpless, I want to bring up two important points. First of all, I want to examine the theological imperative. What does God in Christ say? Because most of us would say, I have a stance on this. And if you're Christian, I want to ask you an honest question. Did you get your stance from Scripture or did you get your stance from culture? Why do we need longer, more thoughtful, more theologically robust sermons? I believe that would solve a lot of the problems in the world. I really do. Why do we need it? Because all throughout the rest of this week, whether you realize it or not, consciously or subconsciously, you are being discipled by culture. And if you don't get a counter vision for what God says is true, we're sitting ducks. How does the devil destroy? It's really simple. He gets you alone, or he gets you away from the church. He gets you away from God's people. He plants a deceptive idea in your mind that feeds a disordered desire in your heart that is being normalized in a sinful society that surrounds you. Behold the downfall of the Christian. Behold the downfall of a church. Let's see what Scripture says. Luke is a medical doctor, by the way. Think about this. He's a medical doctor. (laughs) Writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, guided by God, let's let Luke, the medical doctor, and the Holy Spirit teach us. Question, what does Luke mean when he refers to a baby? Well, the word Luke uses for a baby inside the womb in Luke 141 and 44 is the same word he uses for baby Jesus outside the womb in Luke 2, 12, and 16 as well as other postborn children in Luke 18, 15 through 16, and Acts 7, 19. In the Old Testament, the Bible speaks about what happens if a pregnant woman is struck by a man and the baby, regardless of brain function, sentience, or viability, dies. Exodus 21, 22 through 25, when men hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, and there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. In God's eyes, and before you get all clever and say that's Old Testament, you need to understand the way that the Old Testament laws work. There's three types. There are civil laws in the Old Testament, which was under the civil government of It was a theocracy. God was king, Moses was the messenger, and you did what God through Moses said. That was the government. Okay, so they're civil, then they're ceremonial. They didn't have access to hospitals. And God knew what was going to help them form and flourish was to abstain and stay away from particular practices. So they're civil, they're ceremonial, then there was moral. Moral transfers across testaments. Moral laws are relational laws. This is a moral law that we are dealing with, that is echoed in the New Testament, in fact. What God is saying is that in my eyes, abortion is not a procedure. It's murder. It rises to the level of a capital offense. You don't shout your abortion. You don't dress up as a clown. You don't wear a t-shirt and march in a parade, or stand on the steps of the Supreme Court and take abortion pills, you die. What hope is there for those who hurt the helpless? Well, when God says that baby killers should be punished, He wasn't finished talking. Because that baby in Mary's womb would go on to say, I'll take their place. 
many argue and say, how dare God judge me? To which we ought to say, the God who judges you is the God who dies for you. The God who judges you is the God who cleanses you. The God who judges you is the God who forgives you. The God who judges you is the God who wants you. The God who judges you is the God who buys you back and brings you back upon His perfect record, not yours. How dare God judge us? How dare God rescue us? You say, I've not killed a baby. The Gospel says you killed God. We all come with bloody hands. And Jesus dies for us. He rises for us. He embraces us. He welcomes us. He protects us. He pursues us for friendship. This is why, loved ones, we can't soft sell this issue. If we do, we diminish the magnificence of the gospel, which is that God is murdered for murderers. And that's all of us. So there's the theological imperative. What is the cultural narrative? So let's engage what is being said around us. Four of the most common arguments for abortion. See how they hold up theologically, existentially, and even philosophically. Understand, don't get distracted. The central issue. The central issue is the personhood of the baby in the womb. I'm not saying this is the only question that matters. I'm saying this is the ultimate question that matters. Is what is in the womb of a pregnant woman from conception a human person or not? Not the only, yes, the ultimate question. In God's eyes, the answer is emphatically yes. What is in the womb is more than a clump of cells, but a living, growing, human person created in the image of God with imminent dignity and right to life. You say, what about incest and rape? Good question. The narrative is a woman should not be forced to endure the trauma of bringing an unwanted pregnancy to term in cases in which she was violated, such as incest and rape. Three responses. The first of which is, this is horrible. And we ought to weep with those who weep. And we ought to walk with those who experience such trauma, such injustice at the hands and sin and selfishness of others. Immense pain. And we cannot micro-size it. But secondly, cases of incest and rape make up only 1% of abortions. So if this is going to be the reason for it, are we agreeing that the other 99% of abortions are wrong? Predictably, a pro-abortion pundit will say no, which means this isn't the real reason for the pro-abortion position. Thirdly, this objection fails to address the central question of personhood in the womb. Question two, what about my body, my choice? A woman has the right to do whatever she chooses with her own body without interference from either the government or other people's personal moral beliefs, so abortion should be legal. Three responses. First, a human fetus is not a part of the woman's body, but it is attached to the body in a biologically intimate way. It is biologically incorrect to say that a child in the womb is mere tissue or a tumor. A preborn fetus is a distinct human being with their own unique genetic code, circulatory system, brain function, appendages, and more. To grasp this, we need only ask a simple question. Your body, your choice, so you are saying you have four arms. You are saying you have two brains. You are saying you have two hearts. Well, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. Well, biologically, that is what that is communicating. Secondly, our supposed rights over what we choose to do with our bodies is never solely up to us as far as the law is concerned. This is why prostitution is illegal. This is why snorting ecstasy is illegal. 
because it, prevent, it prevent, presents great harm, not just to you, but to others, at which point there are limits on the choices of what we do and don't do with our bodies. Thirdly, this objection fails to address the central question of personhood in the womb. Question three, what about those with disabilities? Women should not be forced to bring into the world disabled children who would be genetically reduced to lives of extreme hardship and unhappiness. Two responses. First, people with disabilities are vehemently opposed to this argument. There is not a single organization of disabled people in favor of abortion. And yet 90% are selectively aborted still. You may not realize this, but, the, uh, but Planned Parenthood was founded by a woman named Margaret Sanger. She was an outspoken racist who wanted to murder less fit races and persons, and she was influenced by the same ideological tyranny that fueled the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. Secondly, this objection fails to address the central question of personhood in the womb. Question four, what about economic discrimination? Banning abortion would leave poor women, the ones who often need abortions most because of their economic stresses, without any options. Two responses. First, this argument assumes that abortion is a moral good. But is it? Wealthy women have the means to hire a hitman. Poor women don't. Does it then follow that we should legalize the murder-for-hire industry to rectify this economic inequality? Secondly, this objection fails to address the central question of personhood in the womb. As author and thinker Rebecca McLaughlin put it, if Christianity is true, then both mother and baby matter. But if not, if there is no God, neither matter. If there is no God and we are not made in His image, then a baby in the womb is a collection of cells, and you and I are too. In this case, pregnant women have no more rights than spiders or fish or birds. If we're no more than animals, then the statement, women's rights are human's rights, is not worth the yard sign it's printed on. But if Christianity is in fact true, the central plank of women's rights isn't to have an unborn baby killed. The central plank of women's rights is Mary's unborn child who grew to be the man who valued us so much he died on a Roman cross so we could live. Truly, this baby conceived out of wedlock, an unwant, uh, unplanned pregnancy, born into poverty, changed everything for everyone. And to contend for the sanctity of the unborn is to acknowledge the sacrifice of the one who was born to die for you. This is a matter of justice for all humans. And if you're going to be pro-life, you better be proactive. Because this is not just an issue of the womb. This is an issue all the way to the tomb. A big part of this for us as a church is our partnership with Coastline Women's Center. What are we doing as a church? We're giving 50% of every single dollar given to the overflow offering to Coastline Women's Center, whose entire mission is to uphold the sanctity of life by walking with individuals and families through the impact of unplanned pregnancy and abortion. CWC is on the front lines of renewal as they offer Christ-centered, compassionate medical care, parenting, and recovery classes. In 2021 alone, praise God, there were 70 children rescued from abortion through CWC. There were 30 Three salvations and 450 women were counseled and cared for as they walked through the doors of Coastline. Amen. On earth as it is in heaven. Every number has a name. Every name has a story. Every story matters to God. Let me tell you one of those stories. Sharona came to Coastline with an envelope of cash to pay for her abortion. She said, the day I stepped into the doors of Coastline, abortion was the only thing on my mind. I had no intention of keeping my baby. But I met some angels that changed my life forever. 
She goes on to say, I attempted to hand my counselor money to pay for my abortion, but at the end of my counseling session, abortion was not even on my mind. All I wanted to do was see my beautiful baby girl. Sharona decided to carry her child. And she has since surrendered her life to Jesus as rescuer and king. God be praised. More of this. You know, through our partnership, more stories like Sharona's and her her baby girl's can be written and renewed. Let it be. Let it be. Verse 43. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Do you see Elizabeth's humility? Notice what she doesn't say. She doesn't say, God, I've been waiting all my life for you to step up. I've been waiting all my life for you to show up. It's about time you gave me something good. Help and hope rush to humble people. And in this moment, you see the humility of Elizabeth. Why was it that God entrusted Elizabeth with the stewardship of John the Baptist? She had a humble heart. Verse 44, For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy, 24 weeks, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. The last truth that I want to share with you today is this. God gives hope to the hopeless. What is the hope of Christmas? What is the hope of Mary and Elizabeth? Well, for us to understand Christmas hope that sustains us through the fog of our fears, our frustrations and failures, we need to go to the source and we need to say, what is this? And before we go to what it is, we need to go to what it isn't. Christmas hope is not more possessions and more prosperity. Notice what the angel did not say to Mary or to Zechariah or Elizabeth. The angel did not appear to Mary and say, Joseph is getting a raise. You're getting granite countertops. Joseph is getting a big Mac Daddy bonus. You're getting a new sports car. No. No. Um, She did not say, oh, by the way, while you were away, or while you're going to go and hang out with Elizabeth, Joseph started doing CrossFit, and he's got a chiseled six-pack. Let me deal with that acne. You look like a supermodel. That's not what the angel said. The angel did not say, you will not get COVID. What, what, What Christmas hope is not, it's not more possessions, it's not more prosperity. We need to rumble with this reality because we are conditioned to think that that's what the season is all about. Christmas hope is God's presence. God's greatest present is God's surest presence. Christmas is not about what's under the tree. Christmas is about the one laid in a tree who would go on to hang on a tree to buy us back and bring us back. And God is the only one who understands the depths and the dimensions of your hopelessness fully. He he knows it better than you do. So let me ask you this. Have you lost hope? Do you feel barren like Elizabeth? Is there an area of your life where you just feel completely dry? Do you feel burdened like Mary? Is there an area of your life where you just feel overwhelmed? Here's what's amazing. Here's here's why we can hope again in God's presence. Mary and Elizabeth had open wombs, but we have an open tomb. The greater hope than even what Mary and Elizabeth had in this moment is ours, settled, secured with our seated king who has conquered all. Sin, death, Satan, hell for us in our place and on the cross. And so what happens when we believe, we hope in God's presence again? What happens when... Hopeless people get hope, and when helpless people get help, here's what happens, and we're going to see it. We move from worry to worship. And what does Mary do? I imagine that she probably, in these these next few verses, we're just going to read them together, and then I want to pray. I imagine she probably wrote this song on her way to visit Elizabeth. And just in a moment of erupting worship, everything that says, be worried, says, now worship. 
Luke 1, verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For He has looked on the humble estate of His servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For He who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is His name. And His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich He has sent away empty. He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy as He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to His offspring forever. And Mary just kept worshiping. Remained with her cousin Elizabeth about three months and returned to her home. I want to ask if our care team would please get in place and available for prayer in the back. The moment of conviction is the moment of decision. And some of you, maybe you would like for someone to pray for you personally. And if so, in just a few moments, you feel free just to move to the back and invite hope and help uh, through real persons from God's real presence right now. But for the rest of us, I want to pray for you. So would you just um, stand to your feet, actually stand to your feet, bow your heads and open your hearts. I want to pray for you. Father, you are the helper to the helpless. And so, Father, I pray for the person in the room, the person watching online, who's had an abortion. I pray that you would make it abundantly clear that there is no possible way that that sin and that struggle and that stress could not be covered in Christ. That it was cast on the shoulders of Jesus on Calvary's hill. He's taken the punishment. He's paid in full. Now grace is alive and help is available. Lord, God, would you bless Coastline Women's Center? God bless them. We pray that if you would entrust to our church more opportunities to walk with women who feel wounded in this area, to walk with dads who feel wounded in this area, individuals, families, Lord, that we would be good stewards of those opportunities and show the compassionate care of Christ. And Lord, for those who walked in here today and they just feel, I don't have any hope, I need hope, Lord, would you help them to hope again? Hope again that there were open wombs that led to an open tomb. And because of that, nothing is impossible. And no matter how hopeless we may feel, there is always hope. Light, love, and life. For every man, woman, and child, here comes heaven. God, get the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.